everyone, Dash here. Today I'm queued up with C9 Licorice, fresh off of an undefeated streak, 6-0 now in the LCS. Thank you so much for joining me, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. So uh, I'm coming right out the gate hot. Hardest hitting question of the entire interview. Are you ready for it? I hope so. I hope so too. Does Licorice actually like Licorice? You know, I have a bit of a sweet tooth. Do you? I do like Licorice. Uh-huh. I wouldn't say it's like my snack of choice anymore, but oh, oh. growing up, used to go to like the hockey games. Right. Canadian. You Canadian know, hockey. That's how, yeah. how it goes. I um, can't relate. <laughs> <laughs> understandable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and always like we would go to the, the Saddle Dome where the Calgary Flames played. Okay. And I'd always grab a pack of Twizzlers. So. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so red, red licorice as opposed to black licorice. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think most kids don't really like black licorice. No, no. My mother was a big fan of black licorice mm -hmm. and could never like get us to hop on that yep. train either. Same, same for me. All right. Cool. Well, everything from here is smooth sailing, downhill, okay. easy questions, so don't nice, worry nice. about it. Um, <laughs> no, but um, I really, I want to just dive into a little bit of your history. Um, a number of the people that I've spoken to so far on this series mm -hmm. are longer standing members of the LCS than you. So they have a bit more of a professional history to say uh, in some senses. And so I want to talk to somebody who's a bit fresher into the scene. Granted, at this point, I'd still call you squarely a veteran. Mm -hmm. um, where did league start for you? Even before being a pro, what, like, mm -hmm. at what point did you start playing? Where like, did you like when did I first click that play button in yeah. League of Legends? So I was in high school, and it was season three. Okay. Um, and my friend was like, Season hey. three, I was in high school. God damn, I feel <laughs> old. All yeah. Right. So my friend was like, hey, come check out this game, League of Legends. I like played a lot of video games up to that point. Yep. Always a, like, a big gamer. More in what uh, genre? Were you in the MMO space, the FPS space, everything, you know, in between? I was kind of an everything gamer. So, okay. like, I was, like, from very little, I have an older brother. He's four years older. Um, okay. Oh, I have a Ian. younger brother. He's four years younger. Mm -hmm. So. And he played everything, and I, like, I was, like, the player two on the second controller. Okay. Maybe sometimes it was unplugged. I didn't really know. <laughs> <laughs> I never did that to my brother. Damn it. <laughs> Yours was much smarter than me. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so all, always a gamer. Great. Yeah. Started playing season three. When did the hook really sink in, though, for you that, like, th this is the game I'm sticking with, there's legs here for me, and I'm actually good at it? <sighs> Man, I don't know. I think it was just like it was like a really gradual thing for me because okay. like I just I love the game. It was really fun and it was just really exciting to play. There was like eight eight of my friends, like mm. including me, maybe like eight of us total who were playing League of Legends. And we were all like discovering it together. So we were trying to figure out like my first game I played, my friend who told me about it, he was like, all right, we're level five. So now we go to the jungle. Right. <laughs> it's just like, it's just like the, the, the worst strategies <laughs> ever, right? <laughs> but like this is like it's how we played and we brilliant. like. Learned so you guys the were funneling together. before funneling was ever a thing, uh, apparently. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I guess so. He was buying a bunch of like, he only bought daggers oh, and boy. then he went to oh, the jungle. Boy. That's amazing. That is, that's amazing. I started playing only Twisted Tree Line. Uh, mm -hmm. So I didn't even know what 5v5 looked like until I was level 30, uh -huh. uh, which was a pretty interesting transition. I think that's why I went to jungle as well. Okay. Because then I was overwhelmed when I jumped to 5v5. So I was mm -hmm. like, I don't know where to go on the map. Let me just interact with the <laughs> AI <laughs> and not the real players. <laughs> um, makes sense. You talk about playing with your older brother. Uh, that's something that my brother and I did. We grew up playing games together. Um, but you were the younger. So I assume that for a, a, a period of time, mm -hmm. your brother was better than you yeah. at most every game just by virtue of being older. Are you the better gamer now? I mean, I'd say so. I I'd mean, say I, so. I don't see him I in the I still LCS, have to so. ask because <laughs> I feel like maybe, you know, if he were here, he'd be like, wait, but in this <laughs> genre or something. Um, at what point did you surpass him? Do you remember that feeling of like, I just beat my older brother and like, this is, I'm turning the tables on him. I think there was like two moments. So the first moment was like League of Legends focused and like, yeah, I played more League than he did because when I was in high school, he was going away to university. Um, so obviously, like, didn't have as much time to play right. video games. It's like having that like first year university fun lifestyle, uh -huh. you know. Um, so I was playing a lot of league, and I was higher ranked than him. So okay. I was like, okay, that's cool. Boom, and that hey, and you can point to that, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just like, oh, I beat you once. It's I'm actually higher ranked. Yeah, yeah. Like I was, in my first season, I got to diamond one. And I was like, okay, I'm diamond one. <laughs> what the heck, man? <laughs> oh, I feel so inadequate. <laughs> All right, okay. So that's so diamond one. You're like, I feel I feel sufficiently better than than mm -hmm. my brother. What's the other example? The other was we were playing. So Smash Bros. Four came out. The one for the mm. Wii, not through the Switch. Right. So not the newest one, but the one before that. Okay. And I like played it a bit, and I was playing with my friends, 
and my brother was always like we played a lot of Smash Bros. Like Melee growing up, and then like Brawl a little bit when it came out. Yeah. Um, but we played a lot of like fighting games with each other, and he would he was always like I would take some games off him, but it was like 30, 70, you know, right. like he was always better. And then he came home for the holidays. And I was like, all right, you want to play some Smash? And yeah. he was like, yeah, I've been playing a bit. I was like, okay, I've been playing a bit too. And we went downstairs. Everyone's like, he's down talking, right? Down playing. Like, okay. <laughs> I won like 20 games in a row. And he oh! was so mad. <laughs> <laughs> it was so great. Oh my God, that's so brilliant. I love that. I love that. Is he super supportive though of where you're at now? Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I think he's a little bit jealous because like, I mean, we grew would, up playing games together. Be? Yeah, so then he's like, Man, if I was the younger brother, like <laughs> I'd be there right now. But yeah, I mean, it's just the way things work out. That's so awesome. That's so awesome. What do you think it is then that makes people or allows people to be good at video games? And and it seems to be a trend that I could take a pro player in in League of Legends, and while they maybe wouldn't be a pro in Smash, mm -hmm. you have the like mental acuity. And the physical, uh, clearly, right? Mm. To still be proficient and to get there and to learn how to get good at a game. Like, what what have you identified about yourself that makes you a better gamer than other people? I don't know. It's such a hard question when people ask that because it's so, like, it's, like, so intangible. You know, I'm not Michael Phelps. I don't have, like, some thigh muscle. Right, right. Four yeah. times larger. <laughs> I'm not I'm dislocating like... my shoulder every time I take a <laughs> yeah, stroke. Yeah, you know, it's like, I can't just, like, point to something and be like, yeah, well, like, like sucks for you normal right. people. Extra long <laughs> fingers. I can have more hotkeys. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't know. I think, like, I think a huge part of it is playing a ton of video games from really young. Mm -hmm. And then, like, the rest, I would say, like, like, I was good at, like, math in school, like, problem-solving skills. I think, at least for League, I think that's a huge part of it. Okay. Where, like... Every game is kind of just like you're playing as a team and like, oh, something happens, like someone dies and now you have to give up the dragon. So it's like, okay, what do we want to do next? And right. it's, like, it's like this little like problem solve kind of kind of thing that you have to do. Let me ask the question maybe this, maybe this way. I don't know if you've ever had the question asked this way. As mm -hmm. opposed to what makes you or any professional great gamer great at being a gamer, what do you think lower level players lack? Is it is it that problem solving thing you're talking about? Or are there other aspects? either about the way they practice and look to get better, or even just like mechanically within the game, I think that this is a really overlooked thing and it would make everyone jump, you know, a division if they were to start working on it. I mean, I think at like a really basic level, it's just like, like a lot of it probably comes down to competitiveness. Yeah. Where like for me, I grew up competing against my older brother. So I was like always trying to beat him, always trying to be the best at like basically everything. Cause I just wanted to be better than him at something. Which right. When he's four years older than you is quite the task, and like I don't, I I would just say it's that because it's I think drive. like when you have that drive, you don't play like you play and you have fun, but you're playing to get better and not just for fun. So mm -hmm. like I I would say it probably just comes down to that, but cool. I mean, who really knows? Cool. So you were D one in your first season of play. Yeah. If I hit that, I would have been like, <laughs> I, we're got we're going pro, <laughs> right? Like, if I can be already in the top, you know, mm -hmm. less than a percentage point of players, I would have believed that I could make that f next step. Is that the point where you already thinking about it then? Or when, when did pro play? When did this as a career begin to formulate for you? It was hard. I think, like, the first pro video I, I remember watching was I watched, it was the Curse House Tour. Oh, yeah. Okay. And it, it was, like, a really nice house. They had a pool and everything. Yeah. And like, they had like league art on the walls, and I was like, oh my god, like this is like the coolest thing ever. Uh -huh. And I would love to go pro. And that's like the first team content video that I ever remember watching. Gotcha. And I think I think it was like advertised like directly in the client at the time. And I don't know. I, it was really hard for me to try to go pro. I think that like it was really scary because. Like, I don't want to, like, throw any names out there or throw anyone under the bus, but, like, when I was climbing and I was in D1, I was playing in Challenger games. I, like, I failed my Challenger promos and I quit for a while, actually. Ooh. That's, that's another story. Okay. Um, I might get into that. But, <laughs> like, I was playing against all these players who had been there since, like, beta or season one, and they were trying to go pro, and, like, a lot of them, like, never made it. Yeah. So I was, I was like, terrified that I was going to, like, put all this time and energy into League of Legends, and then I was just going to, like never actually make it past that like kind of initial barrier of like getting to play pro. Right. So I don't know, I was really on and off for a while actually. That's that's interesting. I don't think 
too many players are very frank about, you know, like that struggle on the come up. Um, so you did take a break. You just mentioned uh, that you you failed your challenger promos. Was mm -hmm. it what you was one time and boom? Did, yeah, I mean, it was my first season. Frustrated. I was like when they had like LP clamping and like all the one tiers. Ah. Uh, and I was in diamond one. and I got like plus four for a win, minus six for minus, a loss. Yeah, exactly. And I grinded my way up there. And I think I think a lot of it, looking back, was actually like luck that I was like winning all these games because. Mm. I didn't really, like, I was a very, like, instinctual player at the time, to put okay. it nicely. I didn't really understand the game very well. Gotcha. Like, not nearly as well as I do now, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so then, like, I grinded my way up, got to 99 LP, and then I got those plus zero, plus zero, plus zero. Oh, God. Got my promos, 03. Back to 50 LP. And oh, just, my God. Like, that is I am so done with this game. I would have been so frustrated. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, my God. Were you always, are you always a top laner? Or did you start elsewhere? How did uh, you find top lane? I started mid lane, actually. Ah. Yeah, I think. So still a solo lane. Mm -hmm, Some of that still lane. applies. So mid, but mid lane. Yeah. For how long? Um, that whole first year? Yeah, that whole first year. Part of the second year, I think. OK. I, I mean, I think that like when you start with a group of friends, I'm going to really generalize this, but I yeah. think that it mainly, it usually holds true, is that you start with a group of friends, and whoever's the best out of the group of friends goes mid lane. Goes mid lane. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's, uh, that tracks. Yeah. It's <laughs> about all my groups of friends. And yeah. then everyone else just kind of like filters into the other roles based on like, right. they got it. like you kind of have like an AD carry type person okay. who plays AD so carry. So who ended and... up becoming better than you that they shoved you to top lane? Oh, no one. Oh, no, no one. I mean, after I was diving one, it was kind of <laughs> like I was playing more solo queue than with my friends because it was like okay. I'd play with them. It would like bump the MMR up. Yeah. I would stomp lane. They'd get stomped a little bit. No one. Yeah. Really is it fun. somewhat alienating to be that good at something? Yeah. I mean, it's, it was hard. Like it's. I mean, it's it's alienating, but it's also self alienating because if I wanted to just have a good time with my friends and I didn't have like that competitive drive, then like <sighs> I could have easily just like played normal games and played jungle and like played like jungle and moo every game and like you know like had a good time <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, hanging out with them but like i wanted to get better so i like i did it to myself so right. i wouldn't say it's like oh no like yeah oh totally <laughs> totally fair but i think that is one of those things like there are trade-offs with everything right and yeah. i think a lot of times when you talk to people who are just in the upper echelons of whatever their career is right i mean you can talk to some of the most impressive businessmen in the world and a lot of what they talk about is the sacrifices that they've had to make in mm -hmm. other areas of their life to achieve greatness in this one thing do you feel like you've made similar sacrifices in in some areas of your life be it family friends so you know social dating food travel like what are you missing out on right now i would say that right now I mean, right now, my life's pretty great, you know? I, I this is not to say, I don't want to make the implication <laughs> that that means life isn't great, but I think it's totally fair to look at it and be like, yeah, you know what, I don't get to travel or see my family as much mm -hmm. as maybe somebody else who's got a more le you know, flexible schedule. We were literally just talking today about how some teams, before we came on camera, some teams don't even have an off day yeah, in their yeah. regular week. Some teams have just one. Mm -hmm. That's a quite a demand on your time and your energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, well, for me, Right now, I would say the biggest sacrifice or thing you lose out on is just like hobbies. Like you just don't really get to have that many Other, hobbies. Yeah. yeah, because it's like you play league every day. Mm -hmm. You have one off day a week, which recently for me has just been filled up with like countless appointments and just things to do. Yeah. Um, so that's the biggest sacrifice right now. When I was in school and I was grinding, the scariest or like the biggest thing that I was missing out on, which was part of the reason why I like quit and came back and then I actually like quit and came back another time, was it was just like my social life was like non-existent. Right. Where like I would, I was doing well at school because I wanted to have a good backup plan because I think that's actually like really important to be able to, like if you want to go all in on something, I think for me at least, it was really important to have something to fall back on. Like, okay, if I fail, there's at least this. It's not like, oh my yeah. God, I failed. Now my life is ruined. Like, There's two c kind of competing philosophies there, right? Mm -hmm. And I think my, my parents and myself are a little bit more similar to you, mm -hmm. which is like, you can build a base, you can have something else as an option, and yeah. that doesn't necessarily have to detract from this one thing. But there's that other school of thought that says, like, if you really want something, you have to be willing to go all in for it. You have to be willing to, you know, to live in a box, mm -hmm. you know, for 10, or in your car for 10 years. And and it's interesting, you know, again, just to, to talk to somebody who is at the highest level mm -hmm. of something to, who has, has one philosophy or the other. But you truly believe that you can, or, and you, I guess you, lived, you're living proof of it, that mm -hmm. you can pursue something at the highest level while also 
having a backup. Yeah, I mean, I think I don't know. I mean, I really, I really do have a ton of respect for the people who just like sell everything and like <laughs> move, move somewhere right, and live in so their wild. car and like pursue their dreams. But that's just like I couldn't do it. Like right. I could not do it, and I knew that. So then it was like, well, there's three things. <laughs> well, for me, there's three things in school. It was like league, yep. <laughs> school, yep. and then social life. And okay. then like one of them, like I, it's like pick two, you know? So what is the fallback? Or or rather, not even the fallback, because we've made it. You've mm -hmm. made it. You're here. You're a pro. Um, what is the after? Have you thought about that? The after. The, the after pro player life. Like uh, stay in the scene, mm -hmm. find a new role within the scene, or is there another passion that you, you know, you're like, hey, 10 years from now, I'm going to go dive head first into that. I don't know. I... I... It's something that's like, I've thought about a bit, or I've started to think about more. Like my first two years in the scene, it's like, okay, no, no, I'm a player, you know, I don't, right. I don't need to think about that. I'm having fun. But mm -hmm. I mean, after you've been there for a while, it's like, what do I want to do next? And I don't know. I think that, I can, I can tell you what it's not. Okay. I, it's not, I don't think it's streaming right now. I don't think it's going to be like going to another game and gotcha. trying to go pro in that. I think that... It could be coaching, maybe. Okay. It could be something on like a management side, or it could be something totally different. Because I think that what like the skills that I'm learning right now are how to be great at something and how to like, keep improving at something. And I think that if I can actually nail that skill set down, then I'll be like so much better off for doing like anything else after. Could do it anywhere. Yeah, right? I think so. So let's talk about that a bit then. I want to get now. I want to get into a little bit about your LCS uh, career and, and kind of work towards. Some of these, some of these learnings. Yeah. Uh, you were brought on to Cloud Nine, mm -hmm. one of the most famous orgs in uh, North America. You know, in terms of brand power, maybe only TSM is still technically mm -hmm. uh, above them. But you, you slotted in in an interesting time and era of Cloud Nine, which is that you came in with still some remaining members from the OG squad yeah. and have now lived to the era where there are no remaining members of the OG C9 squad. And so you just have this very interesting perspective of a storied organization within the North American LCS. What was that feeling like being brought in and to have your, sh your first shot on such a massive team and org? Mm -hmm. As opposed to, you know, we've got plenty of players who come in, Golden Guardians franchise. There's no expectation there because it was their first split, mm -hmm. right? There's an expectation when Licorice joins Cloud9 that you're going to put up or shut up. <laughs> uh, so what was that like? What was it like? I think, I think it was really great. Like, I was really fortunate, actually, to be able to join Cloud9 and have, like, really good coaching and really good staff from the get-go because I think that made, like, absolutely, like, huge difference in my career. Like, I kind of... I cannot emphasize enough how when I was a new player and I like barely knew anything in the game apart from like how to win lane. Right. That was like that was like my that was my job. I can you know? do that. <laughs> I can do that very well. Like I think I think having Reaper specifically as a coach was actually just so immensely helpful for me, like especially at the start. And why is Reaper such a good coach? Because I've never not heard that said mm -hmm. from anyone who's ever worked with him. Reaper is fantastic because he lets players do what they do best. I think the pitfall that almost every other coach falls into is they, in their head, they've like watched a bunch of league and they're they, they're pretty knowledgeable usually, and they like know how they want to play the game, and they're like, okay, to win the game, you will play like this, and then mm. like that's just not who their players are. Where Reaper, like I joined the team and he's like, okay, like you cannot play tanks. <laughs> so like and I, like when I joined Cloud9, I was like, okay, you know, I'm replacing Impact, who's like known as a tank player. Right. I'm a new player. I'm playing Maokai. You know, like that. Yeah. That was like I'm resigned to yeah, this fact. I will pick Maokai, <laughs> but I'm Cloud9 Maokai, and it's gonna be awesome. <laughs> that's so good. So then, what? So what was that conversation like then between you and Reaper? Like, how did that go? Give me the context of him, or of you two exploring what mm -hmm. you were good at. What did a, you know, Licorice as a pro player ultimately look like? How did you guys find your way to what is now? I mean, you're you're considered one of the more dominant top players mm -hmm. at times. Number one, always top three in that conversation. How do we find that Licorice? What did that? How do we get to that conversation? Yeah. I, I mean, from the start, like we just played scrims. He's like, what do, you, what do you want to pick here? I'm like, okay, I can play these champions. And like, I think that new players always have this tendency to like list too many champions. Yeah. Because you're like, they, oh, I, I want, can put it I all. I can play it all, you know? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. We hear that all the time. That's, I think Mark Z, 
is he's that's his like one of his biggest qualms is he's like you could ask any pro player you ask a mid laner if they can play a top lane champion they're like absolutely <laughs> it's like no you cannot stop saying it you can do it yeah. uh, I love that but in general so we, we move on to cloud nine mm -hmm. you've got this incredible support behind you one of the best coaches uh, in existence when it comes to League of Legends um, and you pretty quickly make a name for yourself mm -hmm. like this is you're in the conversation from the get go rookie of the split into when's this guy going to be the MVP into this is Cloud9's new win condition and he's the guy. Like, mm -hmm. how did you reconcile th th that sort of immediate stardom? I think it was actually kind of bad for me. Like, yeah? like I think that, like, when I look back now, or, like, even right after, so I had a rookie year and it was, like, a really good rookie year, and I'm not trying to take that away for myself because I think, like, especially the world's run in particular was like f fantastic for a rookie. Because, but the problem that I was having was that I was like listening too much to everyone else, or I was like comparing myself too much to others. Where I was like, okay, like, like it was like I'm good enough for a rookie, you mm -hmm. know, like I did really well for a rookie, and like that for a rookie part was like really like unmotivating demotivating like the opposite of motivating right I, i'm at a loss for words right now but, but it was like i like you i got really stuck in that where it was like okay like i don't need to improve that much more because i'm just a rookie mm. and like this is what i'm good at like i'm good at cled and like carries and i don't need to play these tanks and and then i went into like summer split we lost to team liquid in spring and it was like pretty bad i was yeah. like pretty outclassed by impact um at the time and then I was like okay I'm gonna learn all these tanks and I like learned a bunch of tanks and then I went into summer split and I was like right from the get-go I would say I was performing the best in like yeah. the first two weeks and then I kind of like fell off from there because it was it was really scary being the best right then like it was like I didn't know what was making me good I didn't know how to improve very well and I was the best and I was at the top and it was super scary because then all of a sudden like you can you can lose that right it's like something to like fall from so then i don't i think it was actually really hard how did you get out of that then how did you find how did you find your way out of that and into a more healthy productive place i mean that's a work in progress you okay. know <laughs> like yeah. I, th I think it just at the end of the day it just comes down to focusing more on yourself and not actually just trying to compare yourself because mm -hmm. i think i think every time for me at least every time i compare myself to other players you like you either end up feeling like you come up short or you feel like really superior and I think that both are just bad yeah that's totally fair H how do you feel about um where cloud nine is currently I'm not so much record wise we obviously know mm -hmm. you guys are undefeated that just got to feel pretty good um but again this idea that um so much of cloud nine's identity for a long time was attached to that kind of core roster and the success that they had early on mm -hmm. um you know, and and the remaining pieces as others were falling away, and how sneaky was this kind of long, you know, final remaining pillar of that OG C9 roster, and and now he's uh, departed. Mm -hmm. You now kind of take up that slot of you know the longest, longest standing, standing remaining player. C9 uh, player. Like, do you feel a responsibility to to play into? How do I phrase this? Do you feel a responsibility to play into the identity that C9 was before you were there? Or do you, like, do you now have permission or do you feel like you have permission to almost create the next chapter of Cloud9 mm -hmm. because there's no remaining pieces of the previous iteration? I if think... that even needs to be done, I'm not saying that like, you know, mm -hmm. uh, screw, screw those guys who came before me, but like, you know, uh, where are you at right now in that process, that transition? I, I think saying that we have like the permission to do that is actually like really interesting because I think that what happens when you like change a team so radically from like Sneaky, who was there for seven, seven years. years, yeah, um, then you get the chance to actually go back and be like, okay, like this is what Cloud9 looked like with Sneaky, and like here are all the great things that he like added for this org and here like some of the things that like weren't actually working so well so then you get the opportunity to go in and with a new roster and with new players you get to change that and you get to kind of like remake the the like team like the team dynamic and the team culture and kind of like like you get permission to just 
make it the way you want it. Yeah. Well, if you, do you feel like you're the leader of the team? Do you feel like you're in a leadership position? That's a really tough question. I think, I think I'm working on my leadership skills. I would not say that right now I feel like, like I am the leader of the team. I think that right now everyone's kind of stepping up a little bit to, to like fill the gap. Yeah. Um, and I think that maybe by the end of the season or by the end of the year, I'd have a more concrete answer for you. Like, oh. am I the leader? Is someone else the leader? Um, but right now, I think, like, I, I wouldn't say I am. All right, I'll ask you again after summer finals. <laughs> All right. You, you'll be there, right? Yeah. Okay. Better. That's what I hope. <laughs> um, C9, it's, it's become a meme now. Uh, you guys lose the off season. You always happen <laughs> to lose the off season. And we've already touched a little bit on like what, what, what it is that allows C9 uh, to churn out great players, mm. right? With Reaper kind of specifically. So I wouldn't be surprised if part of this isn't the answer. But why is it, do you think, that Cloud9 does in fact not lose the off season even when everyone thinks they do? You guys seem to make moves that baffle other mm -hmm. people, but then the results still come. You guys still make it to Worlds and you're still usually one of our top performers. Mm -hmm. I think that, I mean, it's just the Reaper thing. It like, is the Reaper like, thing. The, like the big part of it is the Reaper thing where you, you have these players who are struggling on other teams because they were slotted into roles that they like don't really fill. Mm -hmm. um, and then they come to Cloud9 and then Reaper's like, okay, you're good at this and you're not good at this. So we're just not going to do this for now. Right. And you're going to do this, which you're good at. And then like players just magically look 10 times better than they used to. Right. <clears throat> did you guys expect to be 6-0 right now? Did you, did, like, did you think you were that good? <laughs> I thought we were a strong team, yeah. like, like definitely a strong team. But I mean, we boot camped in Korea. It's so hard. Like we scrimmed Korean teams. We like won some games, lost some games. Like I don't, I don't know how strong the other North American teams are. Right. I don't think I expected six and zero. I think that actually, like the O part of that is actually kind of scary because I think yeah. that having a perfect season is actually like it's a cool goal and it's awesome, but it's also not something that I actually think is productive to work towards. Mm, why? I think that if you actually go 18 and zero, I think that no team is perfect. Okay. And I think that every team is going to have gaps. Like I think we have gaps. And if we're not actively working on those on stage and like trying things, then I think it's actually a bigger problem at, in the long run. So you think in a way an 18 and 0 season lies to you because it tells you in a sense you're a perfect team when in fact every team has something to work on. But if that's never necessarily exposed, mm -hmm. you're never going to improve. Well, I think the perfect season just like like it actually just shows that you were like scared to try things, mm. or I mean, or you're that much better than everyone else, which I think is like sure. But even then, right? You probably wouldn't try many things. You'd be like, "Yep, let's just dust this, up, you know, <clears throat> sweep this one up. Boom, there's another one in the win column." Yeah, yeah, and I mean, it's not like we're gonna. We should like sandbag draft and just like lose on purpose. But it's like you should try like like weird drafts and like maybe like like G two like switching players around or just like playing like a super top-centric draft or a super bot-centric draft, yeah. or like, like not just doing what you do well, I think is, is really important to actually being a good team. Granted, League is a very fluid game. You mentioned G2. Do you think <clears throat> Professional League of Legends is moving in, the, in that direction, that like the definition of a pro player is maybe going to warp and change so that it's not, I am a professional top laner, mm -hmm. I'm a professional solo laner maybe, mm -hmm. right? And then it's about like, hey, thank God I played mid back in uh, season three and I was D1 because I can now swap with, uh, you know, Niski, Niski and go mid. Do you think that will become a more prevalent thing in League of Legends? Whew. Eventually, I would say, yeah. I, I think that at least for solo laners, I would say that like the fluidity between top lane and mid lane will definitely like ease a little bit. Mm -hmm. I, I think it already has a little bit actually. So I think it'll ease like a lot of it. Right, you know? I mean, we're seeing Orns, even if it's the players not necessarily trading, we're seeing a little bit more willingness to throw champions in mm -hmm. roles that they didn't used, used to be in. Because um, I, I always have this, uh, this qualm, mm -hmm. right, which is, uh, and it's interesting that you talk about, you know, uh, when performing well, sometimes you uh, can fall into or rest on your laurels and not try new things, right? Yeah. I've got this qualm where I feel like uh, pro teams don't try and break the meta enough, mm -hmm. right? Like we fall into these metas and it feels very cyclical. There's three ADCs being played, MF, Aphelios, and Senna. Mm -hmm. You telling me that in the roster of 150 champions, <laughs> there's not something that hasn't been found that can beat these three? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't care if it's Malphite bot lane. <laughs> like it might be that, but like, have we really explored all of the options? Mm -hmm. um, can you explain to me maybe why you know, pro players don't take that approach? Or if they do, like, how that process goes? Like, do you ever think about how you, like, how do I break the meta? 
Do you not have time to figure that all out? I mean, I think it's really hard. I think that, so when I first started, I, or like in summer, I played Hecarim Top, and that was like kind of my break the meta pick. Like in, I played Hecarim and Aatrox, yep. and it was like surprisingly good. Um, and for me, that came from a place of like, oh God, like I don't want to play standard. Like I want, I want something that like, like I want a cheese pick where I know more than the other person. Right. I just like get this immediate advantage. And I think that a lot of players, they kind of just like, oh, like I don't need that, you know, mm. like I will just play meta and I will be the better player. And I think that that's a very like enticing way to do it. Yeah. And I also think that it's really hard to like when other teams are playing these picks and they look strong, like you see like MF, for example, right? And MF, you see it on stage and like MF gets a five man all and kills everybody and all your teammates are like, oh my God, MF is so good. And then you have to be the one who's like, no, actually, I don't want to play MF. I want to play... Malphite bot. Right, right. Like, your teammates are like, it's oh, the counter. <laughs> like, oh man, like, can you, like, really, like, can we just try the MF first? Right. <laughs> so I think, like, it, it requires a level of, like, trust from your teammates and yeah. also just a level of, like, self confidence that you trust yourself to decide what's good and what's mm. good for you and that you will play, like, what's, like, what you think the best picks are and that you will be right most of the time. Talk to me about having Sven on the team. Uh, your experience playing with him so far. I'll mm -hmm. go a little deeper in a second. Okay. Um, I, I think like it's it's been it's been really great so far. He's he's working really hard. He's uh he's a little bit of a toxic European, which okay, <laughs> which is kind of funny sometimes. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. light the mood a little bit. But um, like honestly, as far as like him as a teammate, like really no complaints so far. I think that, I mean, it's really easy to have no complaints about somebody when you're six and zero. Right. Right. I would say that when. And I'm not trying to say that, like, oh my God, under the surface he's like this terrible person. Right, right. But like, when, when I mean, everyone when we're when we're six and zero, everyone's getting along really well. You right. know, like everyone's having a good time, joking around. I think that if we started to lose, it would probably get a lot harder for everyone. But like right now, I like, don't really have any complaints about anybody. Yeah. He's always struck me as one of the most driven players. Mm -hmm. uh, the way, when I speak to him, the way he speaks about League of Legends, I had the pleasure of interviewing him last year, and. This is his. This is his life. I mean, as I imagine it is for most of you guys. Yeah. But for him, it does. It just does appear to hold. Beyond that, like little extra level. Yeah. This yeah. almost ethereal plane where I'm like, oh my god, I don't know if I've ever loved anything <laughs> that much, you know? And like yeah. he's just so into it. And and there has just been such a stark difference mm -hmm. between what it seems to be the Sven scare or not Sven scare and this fan that was on uh, TSM versus, uh, you know, the Sven that's on Cloud9, and at least the way that he's playing. Uh, granted, he's got Vulcan next to him in the bot lane, and so mm -hmm. that's just an entirely new duo. Those two look great together. But, um, yeah, I was just kind of, again, curious. I think it plays into the whole C9 mystique mm -hmm. of, like, players don't play well on former team. They move yeah. over and they play well. Once again, probably goes back to the idea of like, how does Sven want to play? And mm -hmm. he's unlocked to play that way on Cloud9, where maybe he was being pigeonholed into something else elsewhere. Yeah. Have you guys talked much about goals for the team? We, we've talked about goals a bit. I think, I mean, it's hard. It's, like, is it's that a big part goals. of like, pre, like preseason going into the season? Hey, we're, we've made some changes to the roster. What's the expectation for spring as compared mm -hmm. to summer, as compared to worlds? Like what was, what were the conversations for this roster of Cloud9? What are the expectations? I mean, the expectations are like, like it, goals in general, it's like super easy to be super general. Like I think we, we had a meeting and we're like, okay, we want to win LCS. We yep. want to we wanna win spring, we want to win summer, we want to do well worlds. Like, all right, worlds. great, great guys. You know, that's, that's fantastic. Let's, right. Now, now what? <laughs> yeah, well, so then now, what is the now what then? Like, if that isn't the important part, because mm -hmm. sure, every pro player is going to sit across from me and go, yeah, I want to win the LCS, and yeah, I want to do all worlds. <laughs> that's the goal. Yeah. Then if that's not the important part of the equation, what is the important part of the equation? Well, I think the important part about goals is actually like the day-to-day -day goals, where okay. that's something that we've been working on a lot this year, where it's like, okay, we're, we're going to scrim today. Like, what are we trying to work on? Like, what are you trying to work on individually? And like maybe for me, it's like I want to use my flash better, and I want to make sure I know every TP timer, and I'm timing that perfectly. And like, oh my god, uh, I'm sorry, jumping in here yeah. just because I think it was this week all of the the Niski, uh, the Niski yeah. yeah, the Niski uh, <laughs> screenshots of him just control V, control V. He was even timing timers that had already passed mm -hmm. in some of his control pay. You know, I was laughing so hard with that. <laughs> um, is that a new thing? Has he always been that kind of guy? So I know. Um, uh, 
oh my God, totally blanking all of a sudden, uh, Worlds. Me. Yeah, doing yeah. that That's where it kind of, that, that? that's where it came from. Okay, that's he was what watching Worlds. <laughs> I mean, we scrimmed FPX a couple of times, watched Worlds, obviously. Doin B is a really good player. Yep. <laughs> so then Nisky's like, all right, Doin B is a really good player. He does that. I'm going to do that. I'm going to be like Doin B. Yeah. And I, I mean, he did it. Like, he he like played in solo queue. He does it every game, as awesome. far as I know. And it's helpful. I mean, it's great. Yeah. I you, imagine. Just, you come out of base, you check the timers, and then, like, okay, like, this guy doesn't have flash. I'm going to or an alt him or, you know, like, flash on him. Whatever, whatever it is, it just like gives you the opportunity to make a lot more plays. That's super sick. Um, Kind of uh, continuing along the line of this season, mm -hmm. um, who are the teams that uh, you're most afraid of that you feel are going to give you the most trouble, your biggest competition at the moment? The biggest competition at the moment, I think TSM is actually looking like and they're playing them this week. They're shaping up to be pretty strong, yeah. Um, yeah, for now, TSM. TSM, there it is. All right, it's a two-horse race, Cloud9, TSM. We'll have to see when Broxa comes mm -hmm. in, right? I mean, that, that is the big, That's the the big, big thing question. that everyone's waiting for. You know, Broxa, he's flying over right now. He's on the way, so. Mm -hmm. I know. <laughs> He'll literally be here soon. I'm so excited to finally get to see what TL looks like mm -hmm. with him in the lineup. Because as much as I love to see a very strong Cloud9, I'd also like to see you guys tested, right? Mm -hmm. uh, again, it speaks to, there's this question when you have a super dominant team. There's always a question about the power level of the league. Mm -hmm. Are they that good? Are, th are they that good? Or, or are they all that there? bad? Right? <laughs> exactly. Do you have a sense? Do you think it's you guys right now are just outclassing everyone, or do you feel like other people just they just said, hey, it's three weeks into the mm -hmm. new year, other teams just haven't found their form yet, and you guys got there quicker? I think I th I've, it's it's a bit of both. Like it's, it's that's fair. It's too. definitely a bit of both. Like we are a good team. We are like winning. Pretty sure we win on stage. We might have won like actually every lane that yeah. we played so far, like top mid bot all all six games. But it's definitely also a case of like other teams just really haven't figured out what they're trying to do yet. Yeah. So I, it's really hard to say. What does success look like for you in your career? Mm -hmm. Like when you when you you picture whatever your retirement day is, you know, and looking back, what would make you happy? What would make me happy? On your, like, as far as like on things your, that I've accomplished. Well, specifically your League of Legends career. So, yeah, uh, be it titles, be it what, I don't know what mm -hmm. it is, whatever metric you want to use to define success for Licorice. Well, I touched on it a bit before, but it, like the idea of like having this skill set of yeah. being able to be great at things, I think if I can really like hone in on that and make that like a really great skill that I'm really confident that I have and I will like, go like i don't know like interview somewhere and i'll be like this is my skill set and i can do this and like i full faith in myself and like you should hire me yeah and i think like that that is a huge part of success and then i think i just want to win something like i, I yeah i want to win lcs for sure because you're say, is it won. weird is it weird that you're you, again you and cloud nine you have this aura and this expectation of greatness mm -hmm. but do you reflect on like, yeah, but I haven't won anything yet. <laughs> you know, like you almost are looked at. Like mm -hmm. again, Cloud9 is looked at. I think because of how well you guys perform internationally, yeah. people can sometimes gloss over like, oh, they actually haven't won a domestic title in a while. Yeah. In fact, this guy has, and even though he's been at Worlds, like, you know, mm -hmm. does that does that screw with you a little bit? I mean, it's hard. I even even when I was playing in Challenger, I never won anything. I was it was per perennial <laughs> second place in Challenger. Right. Joined Cloud9. The like but a bunch more the second meme places. perennial yeah. second place like LCS team. I mean, I really want to win something. You right. know? Like that's why I said something. Like, like give, give me something. But I think like at the end of the day, I'm an old man looking back at my league career. The like having the skill set, winning LCS, absolutely. And I mean, for it to be like, oh my god, this was the best thing ever. I mean, I'd like to win worlds. I'd like to at least go to finals. I'd like to get further than like like semis was further than anyone has ever gone, but yep. then we got clocked in semis. So I want to go back and I, I want to make it further. I want to see that too. I want to see that too. Um, very candidly, I mean, again, we've set the expectation mm -hmm. or that we want to win LCS <laughs> spring, summer, and do well yeah. at Worlds. Um, is this iteration of Cloud9, the iteration of Cloud9 that's going to bring NA further than we've ever been? I hope so. I think I think we have it. We have the talent, and we have the like framework to do it. But I think you're uniquely positioned to answer this question because you have been the farthest mm -hmm. at Worlds <laughs> for North America, right? That's why. That's why. Because it's 
It, I, it feels like a kind of a pathetic question to ask because, mm -hmm. again, it's like, well, yeah, I, I mean, mm -hmm. what am I going to sit here and tell you we're not capable? Like, of course I'm not going to do that. But, yeah, you've been that close yeah. or the closest. And, you know, do you feel you even know what separated you from semis in the Summoner's Cup last year? What separated I Okay, well, there's... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a loaded question. Oh, I was about to end the interview, but now we're, we're going. <laughs> we're going. Um, <laughs> man, I like going to Worlds the first year, I don't want to say luck because I don't want to take away from what we accomplished with that roster. Like, I think we had something great and we made it all the way to semis. But at the same time, out of all the first seed teams that we could have drawn, Afrika was the only team that we were confident that we could actually beat. And when mm. Afrika drew us, they were also happy. Okay. Like, we were both like, oh, <laughs> That's yes. really interesting. Like, they were like, yes, we drew Cloud9. We were like, yes, we drew. Like, there's a video out there of, like, Blaver drawing Afrika. Right. He's grinning. Yeah. And, and then we're cheering <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> at our computers. So, I don't know. I think that, like, when I talk about Worlds now, or when I think about Worlds now, it's like, I want to be a team that could beat anybody. Right. And when we made it to semis that year, we weren't a team that could beat anybody. If we played IG, we would have got murdered, and it would have right. been really like we we got murdered by Fnatic a little bit, mm -hmm. like a like a little light murder, you know, a light murder. <laughs> and then they got <laughs> lightly murder. they got lightly murdered by IG in the right. finals. Like IG would have like it wouldn't have been pretty. Yeah. So I think for me, it's like I want to be a team that can beat anybody, and I think that this could be a team that can beat anybody, and yeah. I think that's what a real or not like a real, but like what a world's run that I would feel really great about at this point would look like. I don't want to say anything else. I want to leave it there, right mm -hmm. there. Cloud9, <laughs> aspiring to be a team that can beat anybody. Licorice, thank you so much for joining me today. You can catch Cloud9 facing off against that TSM, the surging TSM that Licorice talked about just a moment ago this weekend on the LCS. Wish you the best of luck. Yep, Give me that 18-0 split, all right? Let's <laughs> chase perfection. All right.